Hello, my name is Melissa and I am the director of the Sutliff Museum located in Warren, Ohio. Welcome to the final presentation in our Faces of Freedom digital lecture series. Here we will take a deeper look at the people behind the abolitionist movement. Some of these people were former slaves that either purchased their freedom or escaped through the Underground Railroad. Whatever their stories are, they need to be told. Ellen Langston was born in 1817 on a plantation in Louisa County, Virginia. He was the third child of Captain Ralph Quarles, the slave owner, and Lucy Jane Langston. Quarles freed Lucy following the birth of their first child, Mary. Quarles had an unusual view of slavery for a man who was a slave owner. He believed that slavery should be abolished, but that the mode of abolition should be by the voluntary action of the slave owner. Quarles and Lucy later had three more children who were born free, Gideon Quarles, Charles Henry, and John Mercer. Following the death of Captain Quarles in April 1834, the three brothers were bequeathed the larger part of their father's personal property. Charles Henry was 16 years old at the time. By September 1834, the Langston brothers were taken to live and work on a farm in Chillicothe, Ohio by their guardian, Colonel William D. Gooch. The main reason for this move was the increasing restrictions on free blacks in Virginia. With Ohio being a free state, there were more opportunities for higher education, land ownership, and employment wages for free blacks. About 150 miles northeast of Chillicothe is the town of Oberlin, the home of Oberlin College. The college was founded in 1833 and had radical views on education, religion, reform, and anti-slavery. It was one of the first colleges that admitted both African Americans and women as students. Oberlin, Ohio was also an important place during the abolitionist movement as there were many stations on the Underground Railroad that aided freedom seekers on their way to Canada. Charles was sent to the college's preparatory school shortly after his arrival to Ohio. Following this time at Oberlin College, Charles lived in Chillicothe in Columbus and worked as a part-time teacher and dentist. Not much is known about their older brother Gideon, but Charles and John devoted their lives to reform activities in 1848, Charles was appointed as the Western representative of the Sons of Temperance, and he served as president of the Black State Convention in 1849. At the 1852 Black National Convention, Charles proposed Black immigration and colonization en masse from the United States to Central or South America, where the immigrants might unite with some government there and then make the demand upon the United States to liberate their brethren from their bonds. Charles served as executive secretary of the Ohio State Anti-Slavery Society, and John served as president. Charles Henry Langston is most known for his part in the Oberlin Wellington Rescue and the liberation of freedom seeker John Price. On September 13, 1858, John Price, a resident of Oberlin, was kidnapped by a group of federal marshals, deputy sheriffs, and slave catchers. He was taken to the neighboring town of Wellington. On the road to Wellington, Price was rescued by about 500 white and black residents of Oberlin. John Langston remembers the rescuers were welcomed by a vast concourse of true and patriotic men and women. In such a meeting in favor of freedom and against slavery, as had never assembled within the limits of that consecrated town. Of the estimated 500 residents, 37 Oberlin and Wellington residents, both white and black, were indicted and charged with aiding and abetting in the rescue of John Price. Charles Langston, one of the leaders of the rescue, was charged separately at a federal courthouse in Cleveland in April and May 1859. On the 12th of May, 1859, the jury, made up of all white men, convicted Charles Langston. Before his sentencing, Charles was allowed to address the court. He made a rousing statement for the case of abolition and justice for colored men. Langston closed with these words, I stand here to say that I will do all I can for any man thus seized and held 
though the inevitable penalty of six months imprisonment and $1,000 fine for each offense hangs over me, we have a common humanity. You would do so. Your manhood would require it. And no matter what the laws might be, you would honor yourself for doing it. Your friends would honor you for doing it. Your children to all generations would honor you for doing it. And every good and honest man would say you had done right. In the end, Charles Langston was sentenced to 20 days in jail and a fine of $100. Cases against the Oberlin rescuers were going on. John Brown came to Cleveland. Brown visited Charles Langston daily at the marshal's office during his stay. In a public lecture, Brown stated that it was the duty of every man to liberate slaves whenever he could do it successfully. On the 18th of November, 1859, following the attack on the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, the Cleveland Plain Dealer printed a letter from Langston in which he praised John Brown and his men. On the 12th of December, the day of John Brown's execution, ceremonies were held throughout Ohio. In Cleveland, Langston was a featured speaker and addressed more than 2,000 black and white mourners. It's with John Brown, Charles Langston learned about the struggles for liberty and justice in the territory of Kansas. In April 1862, Langston left Ohio for Leavenworth, Kansas. Langston continued his activism for the aid and welfare of African Americans with his participation in several organizations. He campaigned for black suffrage beginning in 1863. Though he faced many roadblocks, Langston did not quit his fight until 1870 when the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified, giving all U.S. citizens the right to vote without restrictions based on race, color, or previous servitude. Langston is known for his work with the Northwestern Freedmen's Aid Commission and overseeing the well-being of the Freedmen Schools in Kansas and Missouri. He was a longtime supporter of the Republican Party until the mid-1880s when he decided to join the Prohibition Party because of his dissatisfaction with the leadership of the Republican Party and their refusal to recognize the colored vote. In the midst of his political activities, Langston served as president of the Colored Benevolent Society, Grand Master of the Colored Masons, and founder of the Interstate Library Association. He was associate editor of the Historic Times, a local black newspaper, and appointed principal of the Freedmen's University at Quindanaro, Kansas in 1872. In 18, 1869, Charles Langston married Mary Peterson Leary, the widow of Lewis Sheridan Leary, who died at the raid of Harper's Ferry. Together, Langston and Mary had two children, Nathaniel Turner Langston and Caroline Mercer Langston, the mother of the famed poet Langston Hughes. They also had a foster son and Mary's daughter from her first marriage. They lived in Lawrence, Kansas, where Charles went into the grocery business with a partner. He died at his home on the 21st of November, 1892, due to a sickness with chronic stomach trouble. Throughout his lifetime, Charles Langston dedicated his time and skills to improve the lives of African Americans through the Underground Railroad, slave emancipation, education, and welfare politics, fraternal organizations, and many other activities. He was very intellectual and more educated than most black leaders of that time, but he was criticized for being aggressive and vindictive in his workings. He was proud of his African-American heritage and also sought to create a better life for black citizens. For this presentation of Faces of Freedom, if you have any questions, please email or call the Setliff Museum. Please follow us on social media for more facts about the abolitionist movement, the Victorian era, and of course, the Setliff family. Thank you for joining